Welcome. I, it looks like everybody got their info packet. Um, or if you didn't, um, we can pass them up. If you need a pencil, um, let's get you a pencil because something to write with because you will have the opportunity to draw out your garden bed. And I highly recommend that you take the time to do that today because you're going to be so much better prepared for when you go ahead and get started for the season and then you can start getting your seeds and get excited the next couple of days when the snow comes back and tell yourself spring is coming. Um, so uh, today you and I are going to tag team actually. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. So um, our 101 workshop is meant to be really introductory. We do have a 201 workshop later this spring that goes a little bit more in depth, talks more about soil fertility, pest management. We're gonna see a really big picture today and get into some basic things to help you get started if you're brand new to gardening, which Johan, you missed it, but we have like a room full of new gardeners today, which is super cool. Great. Um, so, um, we're a nonprofit based here in Binghamton. We started by building community gardens, taking empty lots, putting gardens on them where people can grow their own food. Um, we now have 21 gardens around Bloom County with about 500 garden beds. Um, we also have a bunch of other programs though that we've developed over the years. Um, so we have a farm share program. So if, um, you're not sure you're going to be able to grow all the food that you'd like to get this season and you want to be eating more local produce our farm share program you can sign up and you get a box of fresh produce every week during the growing season either grown at our urban farm in downtown just a couple blocks from here or from one of our partner farms in windsor or mcgraw um, and if you didn't check off on the sign in that you're interested in farm share um, you could go ahead and do that later and we'll get you the info um, but that is a really awesome program. I garden, but I still am a farm share member because I don't have enough space to grow everything I'd like to. Um, and um, we have discounts for that program. So we sell that produce for up to 75% off based on income. So there's a sliding scale fee for folks that makes it just more affordable. And we have 14 locations around the county. You can pick that up at each week. So you don't have to just drive to downtown Bingham Cheek, go to Endicott with a site in um, Windsor and also um, Whitney Point too. So so here is a picture of all our garden sites at this point. Um, so we've been expanding a ton. We're still gonna be building more in the coming years. We don't know where, but if you, you know of a vacant lot in your neighborhood and you'd like to see a community garden there, you can actually submit a proposal to us and we'll have a training later this year on how to do that. So we're really looking for neighborhood leadership when we build new gardens. Um, housekeeping, some of this is Zoom specific, um, but there are bathrooms down the hall and also um, a water fountain down the hall to your right. Feel free to get up and, and take care of what you need to. And we're actually, we're actually gonna be building a new, uh, an office building for ourselves in the next year using a green construction technique called straw bale construction. And mm -hmm. Stefan's gonna be helping document that process so we can share with others how to build green um, so it is what it sounds like the building has straw bales in the walls so it's really eco-friendly um, it's great for indoor air quality um, there's a lot of really cool benefits to it and also it's easy to construct so I've heard hurricane resistant hurricane resistant fire resistant too strong. yeah they've withstood the wildfires in California um, but like you or I, if we could, you know, smear mud on a, a plat of straw bale, you can help us build this building. It's really simple. It's like stacking Legos and then you plaster over it. So there'll be a lot of cool opportunities for people to be involved with that if you want. Um, our workshops are free, um, but our donations keep them going. So if you have donated already, thank you so much. If you haven't and would like to, we do have a donation box up front. And at the end, we're gonna give you a survey um, to fill out. It's just really simple, just a couple of questions. It gives us feedback so we know how to improve our workshops. And you can also donate online yes. at any time. All right, well, I'm gonna go through the outline real quick, but um, I wanna let folks know you can ask questions at any time. All right, so if you've got a question, ask it. You know, the best thing about these workshops is that 
it, like really are the questions that you all have. And if you have that question, somebody else probably does. So you're going to help teach other people by asking your questions. So feel free to chime in. So our general structure, we're going to go through how to get started. We're going to spend a bit of time on, time on the square foot gardening method, which is a really great gardening technique I'd recommend for beginning gardeners to help you plan out your beds. Um, and then we'll talk about maintenance and some random tips and tricks. And then the second half, we're going to give you time to draw out your gardens. Okay? That's half the battle is figure out where to start. So you should, by the end of today, have a place to start. So where to grow? We were asking folks about this. There's a lot of different places you could grow. You could grow at your home. You can grow in a raised bed in the ground. Containers, you can grow in five gallon buckets. Um, community gardens. Now, something I want you all to think about is if you're gonna garden in the ground, at home, at a friend's house, you should be aware of the issues of lead contamination in urban soil. So does anybody know where that lead has come from historically? Paint. 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 Yeah, paint and gasoline. If the house on a property was built before 1970 and it was painted, it's not like a brick building or a stone building, it has paint on it that has flaked off into the soil over the years. Mm -hmm. And you will find um, in the drip zone, which is right up against the house where the, the rain drips off the roof, you're going to have your highest concentrations of lead there. Um, in every house I've lived in in Binghamton, where I've tested the soil, every friend's house where I've tested the soil, they have lead that's so high close to their house that it's considered dangerous to grow in. So you really want to test. And it does decrease, the concentration of lead decreases the further you get away from your house. But if you had a shed somewhere out back at one point, it might not be there now, but it could have been there, you know, 40 years ago. You could have a bunch of lead in that soil, really, you know, 100 feet from your house where that shed used to be. So it's good to test in multiple spots. And if anybody is interested in um, that test, uh, there's um, just Google UMass Amherst soil test or lead test. It's, I think, nine bucks a sample. Hello, welcome. Johan's getting me stuff, I think. So, um, but test your soil. Don't, don't, um, I think it's, it's safe to assume you've got lead in your soil if you live, in, if you've got, if you live somewhere where the house is more than um, 40, 50 years old. All right, so other things to consider, sun. You might think you could get away with growing your tomatoes in a shaded spot, but you can't. <laughs> so, you know, if you've got a tree in your backyard where you want to grow on the south side of your property and, it, and you get really good shade most of the day, you're not going to grow tomatoes there. So just be realistic with yourself and understand how important the sun is for vegetables. You need a good solid six hours of sun full sun a day. <coughs> then access to water. What happens if it's August and you don't have a hose within like close enough to where you're gardening to be able to water with a hose? Where are you getting your water from? You bring out in buckets. We did that. Yeah. Did that for a couple of years actually over at the mm -hmm. farm. We water our crop when we first time that was real fun, right? That was real fun. <laughs> Five gallon buckets carrying back and forth across the street. It's fun. The first couple of days, you're like, oh, this is a new experience. By the end of the week, you're like, why am I doing this? Yeah. So it's something to think about, for sure. Yeah. You know, so consider that. Um, if you're doing container gardening, it's not as bad, right? But you're still, if you're doing container gardening, you're gardening every single day in August. So it might become a real pain. We do have a workshop on container gardening later this season if you want to take that. And then pests and disease. So, you know, like here's some examples of places where you could grow. And if you look here, I mean, up on the left, that's an example of one of our community gardens. But uh, some people, you may have these friends in your neighborhood here on the right. This is very appreciative though. Yeah, that dude's like, I'm going to eat good. <laughs> um, that fence may be tall enough to keep a deer out, but deer can jump. Did you know deer can jump up to 10 feet? 
So if you're somewhere on a hill, on a hill, and you've got woods anywhere nearby, you know, I'm sorry, that's the reality of life. Um, but you could be anywhere and have woodchucks, right? So we'll talk more about fencing to, to deal with some pests. But I want to show you, like on the bottom there, like you can do container gardening. You can grow some beautiful things in buckets. It's just, it's just trickier. It's just different. Uh, but if that's what you want to do, we'll we'll help you do that. All right. So, um, how about this, Johan? Do you want to? Um, I'll go over this and then you introduce the square foot gardening method. Sure. Cool. Um, so. Also, to be successful, you want to know what grows in New York. Sometimes we'll have, we have a youth employment program. So we hire youth and they work at our urban farm. I forgot to mention our two-acre urban farm around the corner. We hire teenagers. They work with us for the summer. They help us grow the food that goes out the farm chair. Every so often, somebody asks us if we can grow bananas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, there are things that we'd like to be able to have here. Right? Yeah. If you have a greenhouse, if you get the greenhouse at BU, you can grow bananas. <laughs> um, but there are things that are just not going to be successful. One of the things that people are often sad about are sweet potatoes. Yeah, it's hard. And you can grow sweet potatoes here, but it's it's challenging. You gotta, like, you're going to have to work through it and figure it out. Um, another one is watermelons. You can grow them here, but you're going to need to start, get a, a transplant and get a variety that is shorter season usually a smaller, it has a smaller watermelon. Um, so you'll, we'll talk to you about like the length it takes for things to grow and how to plan through that. But important thing to know is that we're in zone, USDA hardiness zone 5B. So that will tell you when you're looking up information on, on gardening, you want to look up information that's appropriate for our zone. Because if you're getting information from even like North Carolina, it's not it's not going to be appropriate for here. So stick with Cornell Cooperative Extensions resources. That's really great. Um, they have a whole um, gardening resource, home gardening resource website. Um, average last frost date of the, of the spring is somewhere in mid-May. I know. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Um, a lot of people say, you know, if you like go with Memorial Day is the safe point in which to put your tomatoes in the ground. Um, and then we're going to see frost starting in early October. So you might actually have your tomatoes mm -hmm. in the ground until October. I often do. Depends on what se September looks like. Um, get your seeds early. It's better now than it, than it was, but in 2020, 2021, there were a lot of seed shortages because everybody was trying to garden at home. There were a lot of seed companies that actually stopped selling to home gardeners to make sure that farmers could get the seed they needed. Um, so just, you know, but we have a ton of seeds, um, so we probably have what you, you would want if you need something, you can't find it at the store, but get your seeds early and start small. So like, you know, it's, it's fun to dream big, but don't set yourself up for failure. Like give yourself something achievable and every year you're going to learn something and you could do some, you know, add on something new the next year. Um, but we'll, I, I recommend that you pick like four crops, five crops to start with for the first season. Get those under your belt. <clears throat> and then next year, do something different. Fertility and compost. It's important the soil that you're growing in is fertile. If it doesn't have the nutrients it needs, your plants are going to suffer. So if you want to grow in a container, you're going to need a really concentrated mix of nutrients to support your plants because it only has five gallons of soil to work from. In a raised bed too, in, in the ground, like if you have clay soil, um, it's really hard for the roots to get the water they need. It's also hard for plants to, like if you plant a, a little seed in clay soil, it has a hard time germinating and getting up through that, that brick that that soil can become. And so um, while, when you're getting started, I also recommend start thinking about composting. If you're gardening at home, have a compost bin. We have a workshop on that. There's easy ways to compost. And that then is stuff, instead of sending it to the landfill, you're putting that on your garden every year, okay? And you don't have to have 
a lot of space to do that. There's a lot of ways you could compost on a small scale. People could eat, anybody ever try worm composting? Me too. I'd rather just do it outside. It's easier. But if you're in an apartment, yeah. you can do worm composting in your house. So, all right. Well, that, I'm going to turn it over to Johan. All right. There were just a couple of things I kind of wanted to touch on briefly. I know that we'll go back and do it from the previous slide. But, um, so, let's see. You know, as far as the average frost dates, both the beginning and the end, there's there's definitely ways to extend that season a little bit. Um, as Amelia said, you know, the kind of the season for a lot of uh, gardeners to say Memorial Day to Labor Day. Um, but if you want to get things in the soil earlier, you can always uh, warm up your soil by different techniques. You know, making like a mini hoop house over your soil, putting plastic over. Um, generally, in the city. Uh, and in raised gardens, that date is a little bit earlier. Um, it's just we have like heat island effect, so things are a little bit warmer here earlier and later into the season. Um, as far as getting your seeds, yes, we have seeds. We pass out the basket. If you know anyone, friends, family, other garden members in your garden or whatever, let them know that we have thousands of free seeds available, and we want to give them away. We want them to be utilized. Uh, so please, and we have everything that you could want to grow. Um, the early season crops, uh, that was also one of the things I want to mention was, uh, you know, spinach, arugula, some hardy greens, things that you don't have to transplant, you can plant directly in the soil. Uh, sweet peas, the peas, those are all. Peas, spinach, and arugula are my favorite to plant early, and they can already go in the ground. Um, and you should start to see some of those things growing fairly soon as far as like the baby greens go. Um, And start small. Uh, we all have those those dreams that we want to plant a whole bunch of stuff, but the uh, more we can sort of scale it back um, and understand sort of the expectations and know how big the plants are actually going to get in the space that we're growing, uh, the better they'll do and the better outcomes we'll have and the more productive it will be, which leads us into the square foot gardening method. This is a very easy method of being able to lay out a garden plot um, using some form of square foot. You make a frame, whether it's uh, wooden lattice pieces, as you can see, or using string, and just creating a grid in your garden plot or garden bed. And within that grid, basically just going to plant one plant within each of those squares. Um, this uh, particular um, plan is from the Food Project, is that correct? Um, great resource uh, out of Buffalo, the urban gardening, urban farm organization that has been going for many, many decades. Uh, they have a great planting guide. Um, and this gives a very easy list to follow Depending upon what you're actually going to grow, um, you may plant more than, um, I misspoke earlier, but you may plant more than one seed or one plant within a square uh, square foot. Um, as you can see, the distinction between cabbage and carrots, right? Cabbage is going to start small as well, uh, even if you get it as a transplant, but it will need a lot of space to grow. It'll, it has a longer season and it grows, it can get really big. Um, and you're going to want to not just, a, count for the surface growth, but we also have to think about the sort of growth underneath, which is why we don't want to pack things in too tightly. There are certain things that can obviously be planted closer together, but um, sort of understanding and observing the, uh, the root growth or the space that certain plants need uh, as far as their root growth goes will uh, drastically improve the outcome of the plant itself. Um, so as you can see in the example, cabbage is going to need a lot more, one, because of top growth, but two, underneath the soil, it needs a lot more room for its roots to spread out, take up water, and take up nutrients from the soil. Um, whereas carrots, they are a root vegetable, that's what we harvest is mostly the root itself. But if you think of the shape of fruit, uh, the root itself that's growing, it's not getting much lateral growth, it's a, you know, it's a very distinct growth that's pretty much a taproot, right? 
Um, so you can plant those a little bit more closely. And the specifics, obviously, they're right there. I'm not going to you know, tell you all the specifics, but the spacing you know, it's pretty easy to find, whether through this guide or on the back of your um, seed packets. Those generally have pretty good and easy to follow instructions as far as seed planting depth and spacing. Okay, so just another example of how to sort of plan for the future growth. Um, the thing that most people like to grow, tomatoes, um, you know, it's abundant. And if you're getting uh, seedlings, uh, transplants to start, they're going to be small, right? But we have to think, how big is this thing going to get? It's going to get huge. Uh, even if you're very um, diligent with pruning the plant and keeping it sort of compact, it still gets very, very large. And it, um, one of the things that I like to imagine is, uh, once again, the root growth is underneath the soil. The things that we can't necessarily see is basically going to mimic the amount of growth that you see on top. So as much of the plants that you see above the ground, you can sort of think or expect that there's going to be a similar amount of plant growth, plant material, biomass from that plant under the soil. So you think about how tall uh, your tomato plant will be, you know, in the height of the season, the end of the season, several feet tall, pretty shrubby, widespread. There's going to be a significant amount of that space that's necessary under the soil as well, which is why we want to space things out. So it's not competing with the neighboring plants. Um, the more that happens, the more things have to compete, the more they get tangled up, the more or the less um, effective and efficient that growth can be for both the vegetative and the fruiting, right? So the fruits themselves, the tomatoes, the more they're competing for nutrients and water, uh, the less productive overall they'll be. So you'll get more production from less plants if they're spaced properly. But I'm going to just chime in also that the if you take advantage of the square foot gardening method, what's nice is you are planting things just about as compactly as you can without like causing harm to the plants. But if you plant the plants you want fairly close together over time, during the growing season, what has more trouble coming up if more of that space is taking over? Maybe you want to guess? Think weeds. Somebody weeds. whispered at you, like not confident enough coming to play. You got it right. We don't want growth. weeds. Right. So um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna skip back to a couple of slides sure. to show you. So if you could see on on that um, picture, things are growing pretty close together, so you don't have to weed as much. Like I, what I'll do is I'll plant my things, I'll let them start coming up, and then I get like, I'll just grab, um, I like to grab a, a bag of um, shredded straw from Agway and then I'll have it for a couple of years, and I just like put it down and I don't weed, I just don't have to weed, it's really nice. Cause, well, and, and unless you have to weed, if you're not having to weed as much, what that means also is that your soil is is probably covered well so that it is also maintaining a lot of moisture. So putting some um, shredded straw down not only keeps the soil covered so the weeds can't germinate, um, but it's when the sun's beating down on the soil, it's not baking your soil. If you have soil with a lot of clay in it and that sun's baking it, it's just wretched. Um, and every so often, even you build a raised bed at home, you put a bunch of compost in it, you still have a soil with a lot of clay for sand, it's, you know, I had that problem last year with a new bed I built. So putting that straw on top was really key. Yeah, and if you're gardening at any of our community gardens, we we strive to have, you know, decent soil in there, but, um, you know, there are some gardens that have been developed longer and lots of people have been tending to longer, so they've had the opportunity to, you know, add amendments, add a lot more compost, a lot more organic matter to that soil to help develop it. Um, Yes. Um, the other way. Oh, I'm just standing in front of it. Well, that's <laughs> silly. I'm like, why did I ruin it? I that's broke okay. everything. Okay. I'm um, are there any plants that you that would be too moist if you did that? Like, how do you know what would? If you, you put do? mulch down, are you saying? Yeah, like the straw. Um, no. So th there was something that I wanted to touch on. Um, 
I mean, that really depends on, on sort of how attentive or how much you're watering the plants. Uh, there are certainly some that are uh, more susceptible to diseases and such if they're too moist. Uh, that usually happens more so if uh, the plant material itself is constantly staying moist and or getting a lot of so soil splatter on it or whatever, tomatoes, it's a common thing, uh, anything like the cucumbers, anything cucumber family, they if they stay too moist, something they're you know prone to certain mildews. Um, so as far as using a sort of mulch to help both with water retention and uh, minimizing like weed growth, uh, either the shredded straw is good don't make it too dense, you know, not like huge piles. It doesn't have to be significant. Um, and, and we hear the word mulch, just I would not recommend going and getting a bag of mulch like wood chips. Do not use wood chips as a mulch. Um, some other organic matter, uh, sometimes shredded leaves. But once again, like all of these things have can be good, but you, there's considerations. There's things you have to think about. Um, Sometimes if you have too many leaves, they might uh, have a lot of oak leaves in them, which don't break down as easy. They make the soil a little bit more acidic with the tannins that are in them. Um, but usually some form of organic matter. I think that's why Amelia recommended straw. It's light, it's airy. It allows for decent airflow, even if you happen to pile it up a little bit more. Um, so that's why it's a good recommended one. Okay? Are there any other questions about that? Get very good pen here. I think we're on the sun. Yes, garden orientation. Yeah. Okay. So uh, continuing thinking about and planning out our gardens, the orientation, um, determining which is the north side of your plot, um, thinking about the size of the things that you're going to be planting and or the size that they get to, and how they'll grow throughout the season to maximize all of your garden plot's ability to get sun, right? So uh, we say, think about the north side. On the north side of your plot, you're gonna wanna grow your tallest things, the things that are gonna be um, trellised, growing up things, whether that is tomatoes in cages or on strings or cucumbers, uh, peas, although peas into the summer, not so much, but beans. Uh, if you're doing like pole beans, climbing beans, you're going to want to grow those things generally on the north side. I like to grow them on the north side and usually on the west side as well because they're on the, the furthest side. You know, the west side will be the last day's sun, the north side. Obviously, it's not going to be shading the rest of the plot. Um, so, as it says, shorter, shorter plants on the south side. Uh, you basically just, you know, things get taller as you move further north. I think uh, we've talked about this. We have tried to or orient a lot of our gardens as much as we can so that the width, or rather, how do I want to say it? The, the length of the bed is north and south, right? So you're maximizing that sun exposure as you know this picture sort of shows. Um, as the sun travels sort of east to west in our sky, it's also traveling sort of east to west across the garden bed. Not all the garden beds in our gardens are going to be like that, but if you can do that, if you're going to be making your own plot, that's a good thing to do, to think about, to maximize that sun exposure. Any questions? So uh, this is just an example of a planning chart. I believe this is part of that packet from Food Projects pamphlet. Um, I think most of a lot of the stuff as far as square foot gardening we have borrowed from them because it is a really good reference. Um, so Do you want me to this? yeah sure go for it. So this is something I'm gonna go my hand. This is something you're gonna use today. So you're gonna jot down the things that you'd like to plant and you're gonna fill in this chart to give yourself the important details you need. Because sometimes it's overwhelming all the information you could get about a plant. Like, does anybody ever have, like, decision-making just, like, par paralysis? Like, there's two, I can't make a decision until I have all the information. And I just feel like I never know enough, so I can't do it. Like, 
this will, if you fill out this chart, you'll have enough information to just get started, right? So um, we, we put this because I think it's really helpful. So you'll put down the crops you want. This is also nice because if you write down like 20 different things you want to plant, like you should go through and prioritize and decide, okay, I actually really care about this much more than this and, and scale it back. Um, then you'll fill out, you know, if there's a variety you really want to plant. Maybe you saw somewhere at a farmer's market once a green zebra tomato and you're like, that is the coolest thing in the world. I need to grow a green zebra tomato. I want to find that variety. Maybe you want to make note of it. Um, when to plant it. This way you know, like, you'll have a plan for yourself and then you could just throw this on your calendar and be like, okay, here's the weekend I plant because the life is life is busy life is busy and sometimes i get myself to may 30th and i'm like why don't i have peas in the ground yet because i didn't make a plan and i didn't just like put it in a way in my life to make sure i just did it because like all of a sudden march is gone and i forgot to plant my peas right so um that will be helpful days to harvest so that is from the point you plant a seed in the ground to the day it's ready to put it's got food for you to consume this way like it just seems like such a mystery sometimes when you're starting out like how long does it take to even have this seed turn into lettuce and this will help you out so you can be like oh, okay if i plant this um may 1st and it takes 60 days to grow okay that's just two months so in july i, I should be able to harvest this and it gives you a better picture of what the year is going to look like um footprint so that's your that's how many square feet you're going to need to take up okay to grow that plant um eventually what you're going to do is you're going to take this and you're going to start mapping it out on a grid so you know how much you can realistically fit in so all of a sudden that list of 20 things you said you want to grow you'll realize you don't have enough room and you'll get you'll have to make those decisions what i a piece of recommendation i have for you in selecting what you want to grow Consider things that you can get cheap at the store. Don't grow them. Onions, like, I don't grow onions. If I planted my whole garden bed with onions, I'd have enough onions for like a month in my household because everything we cook starts with onions and garlic. So why am I going to give a whole bed up to onions when, like, if I give that whole bed up, I use that whole bed for tomatoes or basil or kale, collards. Like, I'm going to have way more to eat and get much more bang for my buck because like a pound of fresh local tomatoes that's expensive but you can grow that easily in your garden bed fresh green beans you were always saying how like a fresh uh tomato is the best thing i can't stand store-bought green beans anymore like they're like styrofoam um green beans like so easy to grow well worth the money well worth the very limited labor you have to put into it. So start thinking about things in, in that way too. Um, and then also you can, you know, you're gonna have information in this packet that will give you all this information. Is it tall? So you know where on your bed you should put it, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And we're gonna talk about transplants versus direct seed in a second here. Succession planting. What that means is I'm gonna plant like I'm gonna plant things in succession of one another. So I'm gonna plant a green bean in this square foot um, in, well, you know, all these peas. I'm gonna grow peas in these square feet. I'm gonna start them in March. By July, they're all done. And then I'm gonna put um, green beans after that in those spots, because it's gonna be bare after July. And I got enough time to get another oh, crop of green beans in. So is there, um, a, well, and even a better example, if you plant green beans in one square, you have enough time to um, plant like one, one row one week, one row the next, one row a week afterwards, so that you always have green beans in season. Same with your lettuce, right? Your lettuce, you're gonna wanna, if you eat a lot of lettuce and that's something you wanna grow, you don't wanna plant them all at once because they're all gonna be ready at once. And I don't know about you, but I can't eat 10 pounds of lettuce in a week. So if you want to have a head of lettuce every week, you need to plant them, you know, a week apart. Okay? So yeah, just to clarify, yeah. there's sort of 
kind of, there can be kind of two meanings of succession planning. There's plants that follow plants based on the season that they have, and then there's also the same plant during that season, so the harvest is continuous. Yeah. In your packet, you also have the seed information chart where you're going to be able to pull all that information and put in your planning chart. So I just wanted to bring this out um, as an example and show you the arrow, show you where it tells you how many square feet it needs or how many of those plants you can put in a square foot. And um, something important to note is uh, seeds can get old and then they don't, they don't germinate. They don't mm. come to life. Um, so this chart is really nice because it also has that information on it. So if you inherit some seeds from a friend, you can take a look and be like, okay, this is, here's the year, there's a little, there's, it's written on there. It tells you the packing year. Um, and if they're onion seeds, well, they're not good actually from year to year. Um, you get one year with them and then they really don't germinate. Um, green beans have a lot longer lifespan. So this, you can just check this and then that little date and it'll tell you if they should be good. Lots of information on the seed packet. Like Johan said, there's, this is hard to read up here, but it tells you like um, how many days it'll take um, to mature. It'll tell you um, spacing. This spacing on these seed packets, that's a little, it's different than um, the square foot gardening spacing. So this is more for like crops in a field. Um, so I would advise that you stick with the spacing on your square foot guide, okay? All right, let's see. Mapping it out. So you are going to shortly start mapping out your bed. All right, and even if you don't have a place yet to grow, right? Like, this is going to get you started. And if anybody still needs, um, I know our folks who came in later, if you need information on a garden bed, uh, a community garden, and what's available, we can we can go over that. And what we'll do when we're um, having you all work on <coughs> mapping things out is, we'll, Johan and I are going to mill around, and you can ask us questions. Um, Right before that, there's just some other random tips and pieces of information to throw at you, okay? Um, because you're gonna, you're gonna need a little bit more information to get started, but this packet does give you everything you really need. But you probably, you may be asking yourself, like, what do I need to plant by seed? What do I plant for a transplant or a seedling that I buy at, like, the at Adelaide or wherever, or maybe you get it donated from us. We will have a lot of seedlings in the spring um, available to folks. Um, so a good rule of thumb is if the thing that you're planting produces a fruit, you're probably going to want to buy a transplant. Yes, tomatoes are a fruit. Um, like in terms of plant biology, it's a fruit. So cucumbers, um, you know, squashes, watermelons, those are all technically the fruit of the plant that you're eating. Um, so you're going to want to buy a seedling for that or start seedlings indoors though. If you're brand new to gardening, save that for a future year. Take it easy on yourself. Um, and things that have roots, uh, like um, carrots, radishes, you can plant those by seed. Um, lettuces, beans, a lot of leafy greens, you can plant by seed. Um, one of the other um, kind of, I don't know, the rules of thumb is if the seed's really big, you probably plant it right in the ground. Um, what, what was the other one besides tomatoes that you should start from the seedlings? Um, peppers. So here's a list for you. Um, yeah. You, I would say tomatoes, peppers, um, eggplant, pumpkins, melons, um, cucumbers. That was the one you said. You could plant them in the ground. I just think, like, I don't know. Uh, be nice to yourself. And, you know, spend a bucket agway on a plant or, you know, like, find a friend who's starting some or come to us and get some. Um, and then things that, like, are kind of on the cusp are things in the cabbage family. So those are, like, you might hear the term brassicas or cruciferous vegetables. So cabbage, kale, collards, um, 
bok choy, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts. Um, those you could direct seed in your garden so you plant the seed right in the ground and let that go, but I don't know. I find I have much better success just getting seedlings of those, especially if you're in the city. So we have a lot of flea beetles and they just they just kind of you don't even see them all, all and your you plant uh, your plant comes up and then it looks great and then the next day all you see is this tiny little stem because the flea beetles have eaten the whole thing up. So I just think like the flea beetles won't hurt them as much if when you put them in the ground they're already a little bit more mature. So I'd recommend doing transplants for those. Um, spinach can put right in the ground. You could go to your garden now and put spinach in the ground. It'll be good. Same with your peas. Um, and then herbs, you know, it's kind of it's kind of a toss up. Like you could plant those right in the ground and have success, but sometimes uh, it, you still might have a little bit more success with a um, transplant. Cilantro, you plant it in your garden, you're going to get it every year, which is awesome. If well, depending on your perspective, I think it's mm -hmm. awesome. Dill as well. It's going to reseed and then it'll come up every year, which is really nice. Any questions on those? Okay. When you go to plant, like don't, don't be embarrassed. Make your grid. Like does anybody have like a good idea if like if I gave you just a pencil and was like, draw me a square foot on, on this table, could you do it? Some people, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it. like, if you get some string and just, like, take some thumbtacks and make a grid on your garden bed, it's just so much easier when you plant. So you could do that. Well, um, a piece of paper is about 8 by 10 usually. Yep. So it'll just be, like, 2 inches wide, square, mm -hmm. 4 inches wide, square. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, find a frame of reference. It's a little bigger than your piece of paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a really good point. Find a frame of reference. Um. As a gardener, one, one of the really helpful things to know is like, what's the distance between here and here? So if you measure that, and then you know that, when you go to garden, you can just, like I use my hand all the time, because it's about eight inches here. What's that? Eight and four, yeah. Eight and four, <laughs> this, yeah. okay. And then I know my thumb from the top to the first knuckle is about an inch. That's also really helpful, so figure out Figure that out, and that, that can be really helpful to you when you're planting. Um, and then follow that guide. Make your 16 holes for your carrots, and then put your seeds in there and cover them up. Well, you know, it's it's it might seem like a little silly, like oh, I could maybe do it different. It'll be better. Like uh, this is easy. It's tried and true. Just do it. Um, things that are going to be direct seeded like carrots, you might actually put a little bit more. You could you could plant twice as many seeds as it says and then thin it out later because not every single seed is going to become a plant. So that's that's fine to do. Same thing with green beans. Anything you direct seed, thin it out. And like basil or beets, you could eat, eat the things that you thin out, right? Just throw that in with a salad. Yeah. So like the carrot example, say you make 16 holes, should, am I going to literally drop one carrot in each hole or should I put like two in each hole? You could put two in each hole. You could even do like, you could do 32 holes and then, and then thin them out. But a lot of people like to go with more like the two in a hole and then you pick the one that looks the healthiest and you keep that and the other one you can either pull out or sometimes it's better just take some scissors and snip it so you don't disturb the root of the other one. You pull them out, at, sometimes they come out at the same time. So, yeah. Don't forget to label your plants. Um, I'm, I make fun of myself every workshop I teach. I, I get cocky and I think I'll remember what's here. And then I can't remember if I planted that square. So, um, even like using some, you know, a lot of people like to take just like a stick, throw it in the ground, and put their seed packet on it. And that's just there, you know, we planted. Water right after you seed or transplant. That's really important. The seeds can't plump up and germinate if they don't have water. And the plants, they get stressed out when you pull them out of the pot and put them in the ground. They need some water immediately. Otherwise, they, they're going to fry. Um, and get that support in for your tall plants, the things that are going to climb, right away. Because 
if you wait three, four weeks, it's a pain in the butt to get your tomato cage over the tomato or to start trellising it. Like it's just like I do that to myself and I'm so like I'm mad at myself every year that I wait. So don't do as I say, not as I do. I just want to yeah. make a comment about the, uh, the watering. Um, it's much, but uh, it's very important that when you're watering uh, that the soil gets thoroughly saturated and sort of evenly saturated, but not flushing the seeds out of where you just planted them, right? Sometimes uh, I have seen over and over again, if you just take a hose and it has the, you know, a very large stream of water and it just washes the top of the soil or it sort of like seeps in and then washes the seeds out from under, you know, where you've just patted the soil down. And then all of a sudden, you know, 10 days later, a whole bunch of stuff is germinating, but it's all germinating in this little cluster over here and this whole other spot is barren. That happens, it happens a lot. So. Um, just remember to water using some sort of attachment that has like a, a shower setting that creates fairly large droplets, um, but that can thoroughly saturate and not just the top, but make sure that the water is penetrating down to several inches into the soil so that there's water, a substantial amount of water available for the seed to actually soak up and then germinate. So it's not, it just doesn't uh, germinate and then not have any sort of extra water resource as it's starting to try to develop its roots out of the seed. Okay? Yeah. Some examples of trellising for you. Trellising, staking, whatever you want to call it, you're creating a structure that things can climb up. So you can use um, sticks and make your own grid. You could use some stakes and some wire to let things crawl up. Uh, my favorite, and I think the most affordable, is this one. So buy some hardwood stakes at Agway or Lowe's. I think Agways are generally heavier duty. Um, and pound them in the ground so they're, they go down. Like you might get a six foot post, but it, you're going to put it in the ground like two feet. So it has enough strength to hold up the heavy things that are growing on it. Um, and then just some twine, get some twine and you're going to string it around. So it goes around the plant on both sides so it can hold it up. So your tomato plant can grab, you know, you can stick your, your branches over the twine so it's not falling down because those are so big and heavy. They're just going to fall down on the ground and then they start getting fruit on them and you try to stake them up and like you're breaking limbs. So you want to do this. That's one of the reasons you want to do this early. And things like tomatoes um, that don't have the little tendrils like peas, like peas and cucumbers, they'll grab onto the twine and they'll hold themselves up. But tomatoes, you need to give them some support. So you could take, like you can buy little clips to attach tomatoes to the twine. They're called tomato clips. I think it's that simple. Um, but I just take, I'll take um, old t-shirts and pull strips out of them because it's soft and cheap and some, you've always got an old t-shirt that's ratty that you could rip apart. Um, if, you, if you tie the branches to the twine with another piece of twine, it's gonna rub against it. Like imagine if you had a piece of twine on your arm just like, and the wind's coming around, like you're just, you're gonna damage the, the tomato plant. So, um, but yeah, literally like in some of our gardens, you'll see people use like old broomsticks and you know, bed frames and whatever to create trellises, like you could get really creative. Fencing, if you have deer, you need fencing. If you have cats in your neighborhood or at your home that go outdoors, you need some fencing. Because what does a raised bed look like to a cat? It's much more. In a litter box. It's like, oh, this soil is so nice and easy to dig in. Let me do my business here. Um, so down on the bottom, you can see an example of the fencing that we like to use. It's, it's like that orange snow fencing, but it's green. You can get it at Lowe's. It's just not as ugly. And, um, people, you could use chicken wire around your bed, but what happens, what happens when you're constantly like leaning over and pushing that down? It's wire. It doesn't come back up. It like, it stays bent. It's somewhat malleable, but it also somewhat, but creates a lot of things that poke you. Eventually. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely try opt for the 
the plastic snow fencing, we have used all the different kinds of like the welded wire, the welded wire with the vinyl. And while they're rigid and they're structural, around like a small garden plot, like an individual garden plot that you're constantly tending to, it, it can be hazardous. Like it'll eventually yeah. rust. It's a it's a poke hazard, and you don't want to deal with that. The larger fences that are more structurally sound, and you'll be gardening with sort of in the confines of the fenced area. That's a good idea to have the heavy duty yeah. welded wire fence. But otherwise, using the the green. plastic snow fence, the green snow fence. The green is nice because it sort of it just blends into the deck a lot more. Yeah, we're even black, but the orange is just kind of. Contrast. Yeah. Um, woodchucks. Does anybody live in the city but you have woodchucks around and like yeah. yes. They're gonna they're gonna decimate your garden bed. Like in one day. In one day. Like you'll have everything come up like, oh this is so great. And then next day you come out and everything's eaten like so fast. And I made this mistake one year. So I was just like, Oh well, I think it'll maybe it'll be okay or I'll get to it later. And I just had to start from scratch, like lost a month worth of stuff, right? So, um, and what's nice about these raised beds that I've given you plans for is you can staple that fencing right to the the bed so things can't come up underneath. So if we do have a bed in a community garden, do we have to like put down the chicken wire for wood checks or has that been done? The garden will come ready for you. Okay. And there may be some gardens where um, historically there wasn't an issue with woodchucks or cats, but we realize, but then there is, and we might have to add the wire. But most of the gardens that need to have that already have, or have the fencing on the beds already <coughs> come up. And <coughs> the gardens that haven't had an issue, we won't have that. We have a couple of gardens that have deer fencing, so we're in areas with deer. That's what I say about joining a community garden. Like putting up a deer fence is a pain in the butt, like, and it's expensive. So for you to do that at your home is maybe not practical. But if you're a member of one of our community gardens that's near your house on the south side, like, it's all taken care of for you. So, so yeah. So the the chicken wire would go like, like at the base of the raised bed, or well. Chicken wire, if you have a real big woodchuck issue mm -hmm. and you're gardening at home and say you fence something off like on that top picture the way that is mm -hmm. to keep the deer out, but you're still having woodchucks coming into your garden, mm -hmm. you would actually bury the, um, the chicken wire in the ground or sometimes people will put it like this on the ground because woodchucks can burrow like 20 feet underneath and then come up into the garden mm. so the more um, you have preventing them from coming up and getting into your garden the better it just becomes a pain to them and then they don't want to do it um, so some people though will literally drink, dig trenches put their chicken wire down like two feet to stop the woodchucks from burrowing yeah. And so at a, at a community garden that have raised beds, I don't, I've never actually seen a problem with a woodchuck burrowing and through <clears throat> any particular garden bed. It um, happened at Front Street last year. Oh, geez. It's not That's like the crazy. woodchuck literally burrowed like 20 feet. Oh. <laughs> it came up right in the middle of somebody's garden bed. Wow. But that was uh, a first. That is a first. And that woodchuck has a different home now. What plot number was that? Marcus, it's not your plot number. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I was just curious in general, but okay. Good morning. Yeah. Sometimes they need to be re rehomed. And that solves it. Yeah. Um, all right. Other tips. Just a reminder, clean your crops, it'll be okay. It's better to give your plants a little bit more space than leave things every everything all crowded. Um use the succession planting for continuous harvest. Water at the base of your plants. Don't water your leaves, especially with things that are prone to fungal disease, which is your tomatoes, things in the squash family and cucumber family. Um, you've heard, have you heard of late blight or early blight? That's a fungal disease that gets on your tomato leaves. Mm -hmm. 
and if your if your leaves are wet, it acts like Velcro. So think of like if you've got a wet hand and there's a bunch of dust flying around, it's gonna catch on your hand. Yeah. Now, when you say regularly, uh, what's that like twice a day, three times a day? No, I would say you're probably pretty safe. Like some some parts of the year, you might only need to water once or twice a week. It just kind of depends on how much rain has happened. In August, you might find yourself watering once a day if we're if we've hit a really dry spell. So you're going to check your soil, and you have a good way of describing what the soil should be like in terms uh, of moisture yeah. levels. Uh, say it's like a nice uh, wrong out sponge um, as, as a to piggyback on what I was saying earlier you want to make sure that the top of the soil is being uh, watered thoroughly and evenly so it's nice to sort of I like to think about what a rain shower would look like but if you can do that while minimizing the amount of water that's going on top of your plants right yeah. so, so what happens if we get a particularly rainy summer then you probably don't have to water as much. Well, do you like, like knock the plants to get some of the water off? Is that going to lead to like fungus nah. or does rain kind of wash it off in, in a way? I mean, yeah, that's that's a little tricky because sometimes. So for for some of the fungal diseases, they like live. They can live in the soil, and with enough of it splashing up on the plants, that's why we don't recommend watering on the top of the plant to just minimize that. I, there will be some form of natural amount of your plants getting wet from the rain. Um, you really don't have to worry about knocking it off. The sun should, you know, the air and the sun should dry it out enough. Um, the recommendation is just to try to mitigate that as much as possible, not doing anything yeah. unnecessary. Um, to sort of go back to the soil saturation uh, topic, um, make sure you're watering thoroughly, like the entire plot, so that the water is penetrating several inches deep, if not the entire, you know, subsurface. And the water should uh, disappear fairly quickly from the top of the soil. You shouldn't have like standing puddles on the top. Um, but when you're done watering, if you, you know, you put your fingers in or even sort of gently compress the top, just feel like, like, a, like a sponge that's been wet, but they've kind of squeezed out a little bit, you know? So it should have a little bit of give, not get your hands soaking wet when you press it. And if you put your fingers in it, like, it's, you're not going to have, like, water on your fingers. Maybe just a little bit of wet soil comes off. And that's Shouldn't it. Shouldn't be mud. Shouldn't be mud. Yeah. That's right. And no puddles. Yeah. So. Your um, tomato plants, I'd recommend if you're going to grow tomato plants, go to our YouTube channel. The link's on our website, on our Green Thumb Garden, our Green Thumb Gardening website, our page. There is a link to all of our YouTube videos. We have a series on growing tomatoes. Um, that breaks it up into chunks and different topics. But you will want to prune your tomatoes. Eventually, like, as you get better at gardening, a key thing to do is prune your tomatoes. So there's um, there's the main kind of um, bran uh, trunk of a tomato plant. It's like my, the center of my body. And then it's branches, and you'll get things that grow diagonally up between the branch and the main uh, part of the plant, and that's called a sucker, and they don't usually produce tomatoes, and it's just a lot of extra foliage. So if you take those out, both there's more airflow, so your leaves can dry off better, and you have less risk of fungal infection, but then also more energy gets directed to the rest of the plant and the fruit that it creates, instead of to the leaves that don't really do much. I mean, it equals more photosynthesis, but they can do without it. So... One just last tip. You may have heard of companion planting. Okay. Does anybody have a good, like, does anybody want to hazard to guess or suggest what that means? Pest control and soil fertilization, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. So it has to do with that, yep. And what do you do? What is your companion that you're planting? You're planting, usually it's you're planting more than one plant together where they have, like, like I know, like uh, I think it was like Native Americans would do it, where mm -hmm. you'd plant like say like a cover underneath something where the cover plant is like fixing nitrogen for the soil for the other one that they're yeah. they're like playing like they're, they're playing like each one is doing something beneficial for the other, whether it's like keeping other weeds from yeah. growing up, fixing nutrients, keeping pests away, like all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So they're mutually beneficial, right? They're supporting each other. So the three sisters garden. That's an example: corn, squash, and beans. 
Um, and also, there's a lot of other things like um, that will keep certain pests away. So marigolds and radishes, for example, will, will deter flea beetles. Um, they're also, um, you know, there's we have a list of things in your packet. There are some things that people say don't do well next to each other. I've never really experienced it, but you know, I guess I guess I mean it could be enough to if you're farming that you could have an issue. What was it? The onions don't or doesn't like onions. Um, I don't know. But you can look at that. You know. Is it certain roads that you know about as an example that you should pass away? Is it certain? Um, some things that have a smell to them really do help keep some pests away. So, um, like I'll plant my basil next to my tomatoes, and I think that does that does help with Japanese beetles. Like I, I have less issues with Japanese beetles when my basil is next to my tomatoes. Tomatoes have a really strong smell. I think it's really wonderful myself. Um, Burt's Bees actually used to make a facial cleanser that was tomato scented. It's pretty nice. Uh, but uh, so that's one example. Um, and then there are some more in here. Let's take a quick look. Wait, where are you? Aha. It's this guy. Looks like this. So, um, for example, let's see. Rosemary is supposed to be compatible with carrots, but dill is not. Who knows? I wouldn't stress too much about it. I'd really focus more on like what does help. And for sure, certain pests, flea beetles, are going to be one of your main uh, pests in a garden, Japanese beetles. Look at things that will help keep them out. Yeah. All right, so we've thrown a whole bunch of random tips at you, giving you a structure, and now it's time to plan your garden. We're going to bring up one more slide to give you, to show you one more piece in here that will help you in that process. But also, I, I like this picture just to point out to you that, you know, gardening doesn't always look perfect and pretty. We often in our slideshows show the things that are the ideal. I'm like, this guy got a little messy. My, the grid got pulled up by the plants as they grew up. Like, that's fine. It's still growing. It's no problem. Like, it's growing food. It's nice. Powerful. Yeah, it's powerful. So in here, um, we have um, a grid. It's a little light, so what you could do is if you know the size of your bed, you can take a darker uh, a marker or pen pencil and draw the size of the bed, and then you can work within that. So this is bigger than what you might possibly need. And then also, so I just have to search to find the right thing to show you. <coughs> this, um, this guy I want to draw your attention to. You can see it up on the Pretty slide. Cool. This gives you a sample garden bed that you could just take and use. And what's cool about this is it's got things organized by height. Um, and you'll see, um, you know, in this row where you have one plant per square, it tells you that all of the different plants that you might plant there that need that spacing. So you could kind of just take this and circle, like, oh, I'm going to, that's, I guess that's where I'll do my collards. And then in this row where there's nine plants per square, I'm going to do the beans. Just like use it like a menu. Yeah. So... It is now your turn to start putting things down on the paper, ask questions. Johan and I are just going to wander around.